as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Did you fellas and girls eat a hearty breakfast this morning? Did it include a heaping bowl full of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream and fruit? Remember, wheat and rice shot from guns furnishes extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And they're swell tasting, nut like in flavor, crisp and tender. For a hearty breakfast dish you like to eat, Get Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. John Nicholas, with his red cheeks and flowing white beard, seemed the picture of benevolence as he sat at his desk. But there was nothing benevolent about his eyes. He was weighing out the wages of his chief clerk. And he seemed to begrudge every grain of gold he poured on the scales. At last, he finished and poured the dust into a tiny leather poke. Yeah. That takes care of him for another month. Charlie! Yes, Mr. Nicholas? Yes, you, Edgy. Mr. Nicholas, this dust doesn't belong to me. What's that? No, sir, I... I owe you this and $50 more, sir. What are you talking about? Well... If you remember, sir, I had a letter from my wife two weeks ago. My little girl was ill, and she asked me to send her $200. There was medicine to buy, and it's expensive living in Dawson. Yes, yes, I know. I remember you bringing it up. But I'll have no women and children cluttering up this mining camp. I asked you to lend me the $200, sir. I remember that, too, and I refused to give it to you. Therefore, you don't owe me anything. This does belong to you. Sir, I... Took two hundred dollars. What? Well, that's impossible. How could you? It was very simple. I, I weigh the gold that's cleaned out of the sluices. One day I made a false entry, fifteen ounces less than I weighed. I sent the fifteen ounces to my wife. You, you stole. Yes, sir. Of course, I had every intention of paying it back. You stole from the Nicholas Mining Company. Yes, sir. And you dare to stand there and admit it? I had to do it, sir. Yes, thief, a common thief. If I were that, would I tell you about it? Would I want to pay it back? You'll go to jail for this. Please, Mr. Nicholas. Sergeant Preston is due here tomorrow on his way back to Dawson. I'm going to turn you over to him. You're right about one thing. I'll keep this dust. And don't try to run away. The Northwest Mounted always get their man. I have no intention of running away, sir. I'll be waiting when the sergeant gets here. It was late the following afternoon that Sergeant Preston arrived at the camp. John Nicholas was waiting for him outside the headquarters building and took him directly to his office. There he told him of Charlie Milford's theft and demanded that he be arrested. The sergeant said nothing for a moment and then... John, aren't you being a little hard on the boy? He stole, sergeant. What I can't understand is why you didn't lend him the money when he asked for it. It's against my principles. He has his salary. But this was an emergency. He should have been prepared for it. That's easy to say. Yes, and easy to do. He's committed a crime. And I insist that he pay the penalty for it. I insist that you arrest him. All right. I'll arrest him. This is the 23rd. I'll start out for Dawson tomorrow and put up at the captain's roadhouse tomorrow night. Get into town the following day, which is Christmas. You'll have to stay over until the 26th. No court on Christmas, of course. 
You said I'll have to stay over? Yes, you. You'll have to appear against him. Ah, nonsense. It isn't nonsense. It's the law. Unless you want the case to be thrown out of court. All right, all right. I'll go. Sorry to hear it. What? Nothing. Early in the morning, John, we may run into a little bad weather. Come on, King. Time the team was fed. The sky was clear when the sergeant, John Nicholas, and Charlie hit the trail the following morning. The wind rose, though, as the sun made its brief appearance on the southern horizon in the middle of the day. And shortly afterwards, great scudding clouds loomed overhead. In an hour, the sky was completely overcast, and snow began to fall. It's going to be a blizzard. I'm afraid so. Where do you intend to put up for the night? Captain's Roadhouse. Well, that's not until we reach the Klondike. Another ten miles. You'd better stop before then. We'd have to camp in the open, John. It doesn't sound like a good idea to me. A storm like this could last for days. How long will it take us to get there? Not long. Won't be completely dark. But you can hardly see your way now. King knows the trail. Unkang! Un, your huskies! The storm grew worse, and the sergeant put on snowshoes and helped King break a trail through the drifting snow. Only John Nicholas rode the sled. Charlie pushed it to help the team. It was nearly three hours and completely dark when they saw a light ahead. There it is, King. Looks like someone out in front. A boy. That's the captain's grandson. Hello, Ewan. Hello. Who is it? Sergeant Preston. Oh, hello, hello. Oh, Sergeant, I'm sure glad you've come. Ewan. There's your grandfather calling. Ewan McCrimmon Robertson. Come in out of the storm this minute. It's Sergeant Preston, sir. I've got to tell him what I heard. You heard nothing but the wind howling. I did hear something else, Sergeant. Huh? The wind died down for a second, and I heard wolves, and then I heard a woman scream. Stop and nonsense, you and get inside. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, I'm fine, Captain. But well, Ewan's a sensible boy. He wouldn't say he heard a scream if he didn't. I heard it all right. Uh, it could have been an animal, a caribou, the wolf. A caribou animal. wouldn't sound like a woman screaming. And look at the way King's acting. That's where I heard it from. The direction he's looking, down the Klondike toward huh? Dawson. Listen, wolves. Yes, my dogs say you're right. Uh, could they be attacking some traveler on the trail? We'll investigate. You want me to come with you, Sergeant? No, Charlie, just unharness the team and see that they're fed, please. I'll do that. King and I'll go. Go on, King. <laughs> Come on, lead the way. We're going after those wolves. King started down the Klondike Trail. Ordinarily hard-packed and easy to follow, but now completely obscured by the drifting snow. The darkness and the whirling flakes made it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead, but King never faltered. Suddenly, the wind changed its direction. The wolves could be heard clearly now, and with them, pistol shots. Then a glow could be seen through the snow. Fire, King. No wolves are going to get too close to that. King growled menacingly and stopped in his tracks. A second later, the sergeant knew the reason why. There were ghostly gray shapes all around him. He dropped to his knees and opened fire at them. It was a strange, desperate battle, a fight against phantoms. Although once or twice, one of the wolves swung close to try and rake King with his teeth. But the great dog drove them off. The sergeant reloaded and blasted away again. The wolf pack faded into the night. And the sergeant and King ran on to the fire. They saw a team of huskies first. I'll shoot. Then an overturned sled, and beyond it, the fire. And a man, a woman, and a little girl. It's Sergeant Preston. Oh, sergeant. Mrs. Milford and Beth, what are you doing here? Well, I'm taking them up to Nicholas Creek so they can spend Christmas with Charlie. Are the wolves gone, Sergeant? Yes, Beth, they're all gone. I wouldn't have been afraid at all if I'd known you and King were around. Did the wolves attack you as you were driving along the trail, Ronnie? No, no, I didn't know how far we were from Captain's Rook House, so I decided to make camp for a little, get warm, have something to eat. I was just lighting the fire when they came. I turned over the sled to make a barrier, and I shot from behind it. Miss Milford built up a fire. And then when it got real bright, they lit out. Yes, they lit out after me and King. Oh, dear. No harm done. You don't have to go all the way to Nicholas Creek to see your husband, Mrs. Milford. What? He's at the captain's. Oh, really? How far is that? About a quarter of a mile. Oh, well, that's wonderful news, Sergeant, but, but I don't understand. He and John Nicholas are traveling with me, uh... We're on our way to Dawson. Did you hear, Beth? You're going to see your daddy tonight. And we'll be together tomorrow, Mommy? All day? You certainly will, Beth. I think we'll be snowed in by morning. Oh, I don't care. As long as I'm with my daddy on Christmas. Yes, Christmas. Oh, dear. What's the matter, Mrs. Milford? Oh, something that was broken when the sled overturned. I'll tell you about it later. 
Well, let's get moving, Barney. I'll give you a hand with the sled. All right, Sergeant. It's over here. The sled was righted, and the team straightened out. The Sergeant and King broke the trail, and the little party pushed on to the roadhouse. The captain, Ewan, and Charlie Milford were out in front to meet them. Who are they, Sergeant? Charlie's wife and little girl and Barney Walsh. What? Charlie, don't say anything but that you're on your way to Dawson on business. Uh, Mr. Nicholson. I'll talk to him. Oh, oh. Oh. And darling, and Beth. Hi, Daddy. Hi, honey. The sergeant entered the roadhouse. He found John Nicholas sitting close to the fire in the large front room. John, I want to ask a favor. A favor for me? Yes, and it won't cost you a cent. Now, Charlie Milford's wife and his little girl will be coming through that door in just a minute. I don't want you to say a word as to why you and Charlie are going to Dawson. Why not? What are Charlie's wife and child doing here anyway? They were on their way to Nicholas Creek to see Charlie. Now, I want your promise... Tomorrow's Christmas, and I don't want the day spoiled for them. Christmas. Sentimental nonsense. Call it what you want, but give me your promise. Oh, very well. For one day, they'll find out soon enough that Charlie's a thief. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Everybody's talking about presents these days. And here's a present you can give your appetite every morning. A heaping bowl full of Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice covered with milk or cream and fruit. You know, these famous ready-to-serve breakfast cereals are... Oh, excuse me a minute. Hello? Are you the man that sells Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice on the radio? I sure am. Well, I'm one of Santa Claus's helpers up here at the North Pole. You're what? <laughs> Well, you know who Santa Claus is, don't you? Why, of course I do. Well, I've been helping him make toys. Now I'm out of work, looking for jobs. You mean you want to help me sell Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice? Ha, <laughs> ha! You catch on fast, buddy, and I'll sure do a swell job, because I know all about those swell cereals. Are you sure? Oh, oh you betcha. Do you know that Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are shot from guns? I sure I sure do. They're exploded up to eight times normal size. Puffed to perfection so that they're crisp and tender. They just melt in your mouth. <laughs> and they're full of bang-up nut-like flavor, too. It sounds as if you eat Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice every morning. Oh, I wouldn't miss a morning. But say, do you know that wheat and rice shot from guns are nourishing? Sure. Everyone knows that they furnish added food values and restore natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Well, then, if you're going to be one of our salesmen, here's something so important you ought to write it down. Shoot! I'm ready! Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. Well, that's a tip for you fellows and girls, too. Always look for the big red and blue package with the smiling picture of the Quaker man on the front. Then you'll be sure of getting the original, crisp, fresh, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Enjoy this delicious, nourishing treat tomorrow morning. Now to continue. A second after the sergeant had made John Nicholas promise to remain silent about the reason for Charlie and him being on the trail for Dawson, the others came trooping into the roadhouse. Oh, my goodness, it's nice and warm in here. Uh, come over by the fire where you can really thaw. Oh, I had no idea your roadhouse was so large, Captain. Well, the largest on the Klondike, six rooms. And you're going to have a bedroom all to yourself, Beth. Am I? Just off the kitchen. Oh. It's the warmest room in the house. How do you do, Mr. Nicholas? How do you do? I can't get over how lucky we were meeting you and Charlie here. Uh, Beth, dear, this is Mr. Nicholas. Well, how do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do? Hmm. You uh, take after your mother. Uh, yes, sir. I hope... Uh, what, uh, what happened to you out on the trail? Wolves were after us. But the sergeant and king chased him away. It's a wonder you weren't all killed. We were all very lucky. Now, you all sit down and make yourselves comfortable. I'll have supper on the table in two shakes. Oh, I want to help, Captain. Me too. <laughs> supper that night was a gala affair for everyone but John Nicholas. 
He ate in silence and resisted every attempt the others made to draw him into conversation. After the meal, he retired to his corner by the fire and began to read a month-old copy of the Klondike Nugget, not even looking up when Beth and Ewan made a great ceremony of hanging up their stockings over the fireplace. Afterwards, Mrs. Milford put the little girl to bed. After she's asleep, we'll put the tree up, Sergeant. Oh, you're going to have a tree? Oh, we always do. But this is the first year I've got to help trim it. Fine, Ewan. Hadn't I better get the popcorn and stuff out now, Captain? <laughs> we can wait a few minutes. Yeah, a tree. <laughs> What's wrong with a Christmas tree, John? And candles on it, I suppose. You set the place afire. Ah. How would you like that, Captain? How would you like to spend the night out in this howling <laughs> blizzard? Huh? You can sleep easy, John. We won't light the candles until tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Nicholas, may I bother you for a moment? Bother me? What for? Well, Beth wants to say good night to you. To me? Yes. You see, it's your name, Nicholas. I'm afraid she thinks there's some connection between you and St. Nicholas. Yeah, ridiculous. I know, but I've had to explain that perhaps Santa Claus won't be able to bring her any presents because of the storm. Stuff and nonsense. You see, the captain and you and will fill her stocking with nuts and candy, and I've got a new dress and a hair ribbon for her, but, but no toys. I had a doll, and it was smashed to pieces when the sled overturned. <clears throat> Madam... I see no reason why I should become involved in your domestic difficulties. Oh, I'm sorry. I think she only wants to explain to you that she understands, that, that she'll have to wait for a present. You see, she's so little, and she's so disappointed. She likes you very much. Likes me? I, I'm sorry. I'll tell her that hey, you... Wait a minute. Don't jump at conclusions. I'll, I'll say good night. If that's all she wants. John Nicholas walked out of the room and through the kitchen. He stopped for a moment before the door of the room where the little girl had been put to bed. Then he went in. Young lady, I want you to know that I am not St. Nicholas. No, sir. Good night. Please, sir. You'll get your doll or whatever it is you want later. Good night, and go to sleep. Please, sir. I don't want anything for myself. It, it's just that we'd like to be with Daddy all the time. Couldn't I have that for a present instead of a doll? What? Did your mother put you up to this? Oh, no, sir. She says that Daddy has to work at the mine, and, and we have to stay in Dawson. But couldn't you manage it somehow? Your father may be in Dawson all the time before long. He will? Oh, thank you, Mr. Nicholas. No, don't thank me. Thank him. Can, can I kiss you goodnight? Uh, no. Please. Uh, oh, very well. Good night, Mr. Nicholas. Good night. Yeah, Christmas, sentimental rubbish, 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 rubbish. Mrs. Milford, yes. I think your daughter is ready to go to sleep now. Oh, thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Yes. You and... Yes, sir? Don't, uh, don't you have any old toys you could give a little girl? No, sir. There's some candy and nuts and raisins for a stocking. Uh, nothing in the way of gym cracks that will amuse her. I've got some old skis and some skates, but they're too big for her. I can't believe my ears. Sergeant, is that John Nicholas worrying about a kid's Christmas? <coughs> I'm only worried about my peace of mind. Uh, uh, a fine uh, thing uh, to be uh, shut uh, up uh, with a squalling uh, infant for a whole day. Beth won't cry, Mr. Nicholas. Really, it seems to me that you and your wife could manage things a little better. Wait a minute. I have an idea. It's about time someone did. Captain, Pierre Renault. Say, wouldn't that be great? It's impossible. Don't argue with the sergeant, Captain. He has an idea. Let him work it out his own way. Well, what is it, Sergeant? Who's this Pierre Renault? Well, he's a trapper, and he lives five miles away, up on the ridge. You could never get there in this storm, Sergeant. All I have to do, Captain, is keep on climbing until I reach the top of the ridge and then follow it to the west until I reach Pierre's cabin. Yes, but following the ridge when you can't see three feet in front of you. If you take one false step in some places, you'll drop 200 feet. King won't let me do that, will you, boy? It's a wonderful idea. It's suicide. What are you talking about? You'll find out when I get back. Come on, King. 
Five minutes later, the sergeant and King set out for Pierre Renault's cabin. Let's go, boy. Before they had taken five steps, the storm blotted them out. The others went to work setting up the Christmas tree and decorating it. It was long after midnight when they finished, and there was no sign of the sergeant. Well, I guess we'd all better go to bed. He may wait until morning to make the return trip. But I'll leave a lamp in this window and one out in the kitchen just in case. Right. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. Just before dawn, a wolverine saw the light in the kitchen window. With the cunning of his kind, the vicious little animal knew that where there was such a light, there were men. And where there were men, there was food. He fought his way through the drifts to the house and then burrowed deep into the snow. The chinks between the logs had been filled with moss. He tore this away with his savage teeth and began to gnaw at the wood. There was food inside the building, and he worked furiously. At last, the hole was large enough for him to squeeze through. Now, the smell of food was close. It was all around him in the warm room. Suddenly, a door opened at the far side of the room. Beth stood in the doorway, sleepily rubbing her eyes. In the glow from the partially opened door of the stove, she saw the wolverine. Wolverine's eyes were red with hatred. He started toward the little girl. The sergeant and King were able to see the lights from the roadhouse when King broke into a run. The sergeant found it hard to keep up with him. Easy, boy, easy. No need to run now. What's the matter with you? The great dog threw himself against the door of the roadhouse. All right, King, I'll open the door just as soon as I get out of these snowshoes. There. As soon as the door was open, King ran in and straight on to the kitchen door. You'll wake everybody up, King. Quiet. I'll let you out there as soon as I put our young friend down in front of the tree. Just as the sergeant reached the kitchen door, Beth screamed. The sergeant threw open the door, and King leaped across the kitchen. The little girl was huddled in a corner, her hands over her face. The Wolverine turned to meet King, but the dog evaded the vicious cut of his teeth, caught him by the back of the neck, and threw him far across the room. The sergeant picked up Beth and carried her out of the kitchen. Sergeant, Sergeant, what is it? Take her, Mrs. Milford. She's all right. What happened? A wolverine. King's taking care of him. Oh, baby, baby, don't cry. As the sergeant re-entered the kitchen, the wolverine charged King. At the last second, the dog leaped aside. The murderous jaws slashed the air. Once more, King risked his throat to grab the wolverine by the back of the neck. Once more, he tossed him in the air. And this time, he hit the stove as he landed. King closed in. And a moment later, the savage little beast lay still. Good work, boy. You saved the little girl's life. When the sergeant and King returned to the living room, Beth was still crying quietly in her mother's arms while all the men stood around her. A wolverine, Sergeant. King, get him? Yes, all over. Those little devils can get in anywhere. I thought it was a kitty that Santa Claus had brought me. Well, dear, you come over here by the tree and let me show you what Santa Claus did bring you. Come on, take my hand. Honest? He brought me something? Is it a dolly? We'll see if you don't think it's better than a dolly. Where? Underneath the tree there. I'll just turn that blanket back. <gasps> Mommy! It's a puppy. Yes, dear. Is he really mine? He's really yours. Mommy, look at him. All soft and white. Just like a ball of cotton. <laughs> oh, puppy, I love you. I love you. And he loves me too, Mommy. <laughs> look, he's licking my hand. See how pink his little tongue is? Oh, he's beautiful, darling. <laughs> he's a genuine Siberian. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy's singing. <laughs> Perhaps he's singing your Christmas carol, dear. Why don't you sing with him? I will. Come on, you one. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to serve them for shepherds in fields where they lay. Roger, uh, come over here a minute, will you? Yes, John? <coughs> I'd, uh, I'd give anything if I'd been the one who brought that child the puppy. You would? <coughs> well, uh, within reason. John, you can make her a much better present than a puppy. Yes. Yes, I suppose I can. And I'll do it. Excuse me. Uh, Charlie, I want a word with you. 
Yes, sir. Uh, after this, uh, this storm is over, I want you and your wife and Beth to come back to Nicholas Creek with me. Sir, you... You mean that you're giving me another chance? Uh, well, you still owe me a little money. There's no reason why you shouldn't work it out. Oh, I'll be glad to, sir. And Anne and Beth. Yes, yes. Uh, good idea to have them around. You can concentrate better and make yourself more valuable to me. Sir, all I can say is thank you. But I promise, sir, I... I am grateful. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, what do you say we uh, join in the singing? Fine, fine. Look at Charlie's face, King. I can imagine what John told him. It's a Merry Christmas for everybody. But my guess is right, boy. This case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Well, sir, fellas and girls, next Sunday is the day you've been looking forward to for so long. Yes, and right here is someone who wants to say something to each and every one of you. Here is Sergeant Preston himself. And naturally, I don't have to tell you that King is here, too, right beside him. (laughs) Fellas and girls, King and I just want to say this. We hope that you and your family and friends have the most wonderful Christmas ever. How about it, King? (coughs) That's King's way of saying for the both of us, Merry Christmas. And Sergeant Preston, that goes for me and for all of us here. And for the Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Yes, from all of us, a Merry Christmas to one and all. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of Journey for Revenge. When an old sourdough came to me with the story of Ned Tyler's reason for coming to the Yukon, I knew that something would have to be done to turn him from his decision. The plan I had to get the truth and prevent a murder was one that put me on the spot with a killer. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat.